Welcome to the Richard Blackby Leadership Podcast, helping people take their leadership to the next level. Brought to you by Blackby Ministries International. Well, welcome to the podcast, everyone. It's good to have all of you here with us listening. And uh, Richard, it's always a pleasure to sit across from you. I'm sure it is, Sam. (laughs) Thanks. Good to be with you and all the listeners today. Yeah, well, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we did a book review, and uh, we forgot to mention uh, what book we're going to review next time. And so would you tell us uh, what we've got coming up so that our readers or our listeners can be reading ahead? Okay. There's another book, and I don't necessarily entirely agree with it, but it's one that's certainly worth uh, discussing, and it's by Marcus Buckingham and Donald Clifton, called Now, Discover Your Strengths, and then the subtitle, The Revolutionary Program That Shows You How to Develop Your Unique Talents and Strengths and Those of the People You Manage. Uh, It's quite the subtitle. It is. Uh, Buckingham is uh, the CEO of uh, Gallup and uh, has done a lot of surveys of people. He wrote an earlier book called First Break All the Rules, which is interesting. And uh, and so this is one of those books, I, I, I there's some things that I think I would question, but I'd like the readers to read it. And his basic premise is uh, focus on what you're good at, uh, where, what you hit home runs with, work out of your sweet spot. Yeah. And so there's certainly Play some, to your strengths. Yeah. So certainly merit to that. He has a whole strengths finder uh, survey where you can discover what your strengths are. Uh, and uh, so that's uh, that we'll look at that, and there's certainly merit to that, and also some dangers. And so, it's it's certainly I think an issue that leaders and uh, for themselves as well as those they lead need to be aware of when they uh, are involved in leadership. Well, great, and uh, we'll leave links to that as always in the show notes, and uh, you can be reading along uh, before we we do our podcast on that. And if you have questions or uh, concerns or observations about the book. We'd love to hear from you as well. So podcast at blackaby.org, or you can tweet Richard uh, at Richard Blackaby. Yeah, and I'd say there's a bunch of, of newer books that I've been, uh, I've got a stack of them on my desk right now. I'm reading through and uh, several of them look very interesting. And so some of these are some of the books that uh, have been stack pull books that have really influenced leaders and in business and the church in years past. But uh, I am going to also start introducing a few of the newer books, some brand new to me. And so we we'll try to kind of mix it up with some books that have exerted influence and over time, and then just some books that are hitting the press right now and are having an influence right now, and people are still trying to figure them out. Yeah, and and speaking of uh, having influence over time, we are uh, <laughs> nice segue. I like that. You know, I, I think you're getting, getting better good. at this, Sam. I have to say that. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you. So speaking of uh, people of influence. Uh, we do this. We try and do this once a month ish, mm-hmm. um, but uh, today we're going to look at uh, a leadership profile, do a, a leadership biography. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we've mentioned in podcast past that, that Richard has a whole shelf dedicated. Uh, to, so many biographies, to so biography. little time. <laughs> it's it's one of his favorite pastimes. <laughs> For sure. biographies. So, uh, Richard, can you tell us uh, who we're looking at today and, and why? Well, I thought we'd look at William Wilberforce today. Uh, he's yeah. an interesting uh, person and uh, certainly has had a great influence. Uh, there's there's several books, biographies uh, written about him, but the one that I'd highlight today would be that by Eric Metaxas, who wrote uh, a book just a couple of years ago, and it's called, uh, the title is Amazing Grace, and then the subtitle, William Wilberforce and the Heroic Campaign to End Slavery. And uh, a movie was made based on this particular biography that was uh, very well done as well. And so he, I think uh, his life, he's a politician, he's a person that impacted uh, the moral standing of a nation and really the world. And so I think especially in the time in which we live, he's a great person for us to circle around and look at today. Yeah, and so when you look back at history, it seems obvious now that that someone like a Wilberforce would would obviously make history, yeah. Um, but it wasn't always the case uh, for for the for their contemporaries at the time. Can you speak to that some? Yeah, you know, and that's the thing about history. We, when we look back, we say, well, of course Napoleon was famous, or of course Churchill was famous, or you know, we look at down the line of people like Wilberforce and say, well, of course they changed the world, but. And it seems so natural to them. But when you read their biography, you realize, well, it wasn't so obvious at the time. And even their own parents may have doubted that they had what it took. 
you know, a person like uh, the Duke of Wellington that we'll have to do a biography on at some point. Um, w- when his parents got into dire straits financially, they, they couldn't afford to keep all their kids in school. So they kept him out because they, he showed the least promise. Hmm. And that's their parent, his own parents saying that. Of course, he'll later become prime minister and the, the famous, one of the most famous generals in uh, British history, defeating Napoleon. But uh, so earlier on, sometimes the people that, that uh, when you look at them back in their day, uh, they're not the most intelligent, they're, they're not the most gifted, but through a series of perseverance and sometimes lucky breaks in the providence of God, uh, they end up being someone that impacts history for generations to come. And so Wilberforce is certainly one of those people, uh, you know, he was only five foot three inches tall which in his day probably was not as short perhaps as it might be considered on average height now. But, uh, but he certainly from a physical perspective was very diminutive. He had a, a, a weak constitution. He had all kinds of stomach ailments all of his life. Uh, had to, at times he'd be bedridden and overcome with illness and incapacitated. Uh, and so rather sickly, he had a a problem with his spine that got grew worse over time that kind of left him hunched over. And uh, so he's already fairly short to begin with, and now he's, he's, he's hunched over as well. So, hmm. I mean, you just look at him physically and you just say, this guy is not going to change the world. Uh, he's uh, his, one, really one of his best friends is William Pitt, who's going to become a famous uh, prime minister of England. He looks more the part of a national leader. And then you look at Wilberforce and say, well, he's just a tag along. He's, he's someone that uh, doesn't show the kind of giftedness necessarily that you'd expect. Uh, and a couple other things about Wilberforce. One is his uh, father dies at a relatively young age. His father's about 40 or so. And then his mother becomes quite ill. So he's actually farmed out uh, to an uncle and aunt's house to raise for a number of years. And so again, here's a guy who loses his father pretty early in his life. Uh, and now his parents can't even keep him. And so he's farmed out again. You know, you think, well, not the kind of guy that's being groomed uh, to be a national leader one day. Uh, And then uh, eventually as he gets into college, uh, he goes to Cambridge University, and uh, he gets into the sort of the the, the party crowd. And uh, he's a, uh, Wilberforce is a people person, very popular, people like him. And he just enjoys that, joins clubs, and uh, uh, and as he ultimately wins uh, office in the House of Commons, uh, he's being courted now and invited to join all the popular clubs of the day. And that's kind of what you did in British aristocracy. There were all kinds of men's clubs in the sure. around London, and, and you joined them and hung out there and met uh, famous people and drank and told tall, tall stories and... And so he loves that, and uh, and he later will say he squandered some of the best, most important years of his life in just aimless, social, petty, worldly pursuits. That he always regretted that that uh, in his youth he squandered a number of years just pursuing the things of the world and not really caring a lot uh, about things that mattered. Yeah, uh, and he he also had poor eyesight, and so for a guy who's uh, involved in having to read through lots of documents and reports and to give lots of speeches. Uh, poor eyesight's another thing that's not necessarily helpful to him in his career. And so all that to say, uh, he's, and, he's, and he's born into a family that are not strong uh, Christians. Uh, he, his, his parents uh, were, I think, nice people. But in the day in which uh, Wilberforce lived, there was kind of a high Anglicanism, especially for the the, the wealthier people, that uh, did not take. I mean, it was all about ritual. You you belonged to the church. You might go to uh, certain ceremonies and ritual, but it didn't affect the way you lived. Uh, in fact, you were seen as a fanatic if you let your Christ, your religious beliefs affect your the way you did business or politics. Mm. It was considered a little e- extremism to do that, and so. That's that's the family he was born into that did not take uh, uh, Christianity that seriously and it shouldn't affect the way you lived or worked. And so when you just overall looked at Wilberforce and what he was handed as he was born, uh, he's not the kind of person you look to and say, okay, that's a guy who's going to change the world. But in in many ways you could say, but that's exactly what he did. So why would you say that some people do 
uh, change the world and, and others don't seem to make a difference. Well, you know, I think at least in Wilberforce's case, uh, he, he ultimately saw the hand of God upon his life. Uh, when he was given up uh, to be raised by relatives, the interesting fact was he was uh, put in the care of uh, uh, some relatives who actually were evangelical Christians. And so the interesting thing is, you know, you think what a tragedy. His father dies at age 40. Now Wilberforce is farmed out uh, to relatives to care for. But he ends up in the, in the home of people who actually took Christ very seriously. In fact, uh, the, the, his relatives who raised him were good friends with George Whitfield, one of the greatest evangelists of all time, and also John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace and uh, ultimately would also help him be introduced to people like John Wesley. And so some of the greatest Christian leaders of all time, who all kind of overlapped that time period, by the, by the providential hand of God, he ends up coming in contact with some of those people that will have a deep impact on his life uh, later on. And then he has his own, uh, and you know, if you look back over Wilberforce's life, he always had friends, he always had people around him, and at just key moments, now sometimes those friends carried him into the ways of the world when he was mm -hmm. in college, but also it, even when he was at his worst, it just seemed like God always put a godly person as maybe the person whose dorm room was right next to his, and or a Christian person who had just at the right time would suggest a Christian book that he might be interested in reading. And he'd read that book and then be deeply impacted uh, as a result. And, uh, you know, his one friend becomes William Pitt while they're in university in, in Cambridge together. Th this good friend he makes in college becomes one of the most famous prime ministers of England. Uh, and so he, you, you look and you see, well... Uh, some of that, I think, is his engaging personality that attracts people to him. But but he also, I think, recognizes the hand of God in the relationships around him. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the keys. Now, I'm always telling people, there's a difference. that The world will say, just politic, just make contacts, network. And, yeah. and, you know, from a secular perspective, that's important. But from a Christian perspective, I think there's certainly a stewardship of relationships, a stewardship of contacts. So why did God help me meet this person? Uh, and it, even in my own life, I've seen a number of times where I met someone, and, and at the time, it, it didn't seem like a meaningful introduction. Mm -hmm. But then out of that, all kinds of opportunities arise. And suddenly, I, I need help, and this person crosses my path. Or, uh, or because I met this person in, a, in an airport. Now I'm being invited to go speak at this conference and it's opening up a whole new opportunity for me. And so uh, you, you can look back over Wilberforce's life and it seemed like every time there was a critical moment in his life, God would bring someone across his path that could help him. And certainly to eradicate slavery in the British Empire is not something that one person could do. And, sure. and I think perhaps because Wilberforce was frail in health all of his life. He, he, I think that helped him realize he, he wasn't a superhero. He couldn't do it on his own. And so he had to rely upon other people, which I think is good. I think sometimes as leaders, we want to roll up our sleeves and change the world by ourselves. Wilberforce always realized that uh, he couldn't do that. Uh, his health could break down very easily. And so he always had other people around. There was always a group around him uh, that were willing to help him and that loved him and were loyal to him. And uh, at just the key moments, it seemed, God would always bring just the right person around his life that enabled him to have the influence that he had. And so he started out, um, he got elected to parliament when he's only 21 years old, uh, which was really quite remarkable. And in, in his day, you kind of had to bribe. You literally would, would pass out <laughs> coins to the people that were going to vote for you. He had a huge barbecue, uh, roasted a huge ox, uh, and gave it to all the people you know, I mean, now even he said later that because that was before he really was living by Christian principles, he just kind of did what everybody did. And uh, he later he said, now that I'm a Christian, I I probably could never have been elected to to, to government <laughs> because I wouldn't have I would have had too much integrity to do what it takes to win. But right. but uh, he gets elected early on, and then at key times, like I said, he'll meet a John Newton or he'll get a a letter from an, an older John Wesley that will encourage him to stay the course. And, uh, and, and it's, that's sort of fascinating to me how 
these great, great Christian leaders seemed to intersect his life at just the right moment. And it's almost as if those people who walked really closely with God uh, just always seemed to have uh, an instinct toward what God was doing in the nation at the time and where God was doing it. And they can just sense God's hands on Wilberforce. And so they gather around at key moments. And uh, and I think it's important for leaders never to take that lightly when uh, maybe an, a veteran leader pulls you aside or says a word takes time to invest in your life. Um, take those moments very seriously because you'll look back later and maybe say, that was a turning point. I didn't even realize at the time. And uh, certainly for Wilberforce, he has a moment where it begins with a friend just suggesting a book for him to read. He reads the book and then uh, that sets him on a journey to read the scriptures. And ultimately he has an encounter with God. And it's not just a, a night and day sort of thing with Wilberforce. It takes time. Uh, but uh, at, at a certain point, he suddenly comes to a conviction that his life cannot remain the same. He's been pursuing his own career. Uh, he's been pursuing his own fame, his his moment in the sun. Uh, as he and, and, and Pitt are rising in political influence, Pitt's going to become the prime minister first, but it's fully expected that his lieutenant, his close friend, uh, Wilberforce, will then become prime minister. Mm -hmm. That's the ultimate that he can achieve. And then he has this encounter with God that, it, that changes all of his priorities. And uh, Metaxas says that at that point, he fundamentally changed his view on two things. One was his view of money. Instead of accumulating money and using it for pleasure, now his money is being invested in changing the world, uh, making a difference, uh, not just squandering it all on, on his own pleasure, which the aristocracy of his day, that's what you did. You had a summer... Yeah. You had a, a weekend house in the country. You just you didn't care about the suffering, the poor. That was their problem. Uh, God had blessed you to be nobility and to be smart and successful. And so why spoil your day thinking about the poor and yeah. the oppressed? Uh, and the other was his view of time changed. And he began to realize time is fleeting. It's, it's passing quickly. And he, he did not want to squander his time. And uh, he realized by this time already that he had wasted some prime years in his early life, and he, he did not want to do that anymore. And interestingly, as he's dying, basically, just uh, shortly before he dies, his life's work, finally, the emancipation of all the slaves in the British Empire takes place. And shortly after that, just days afterward, he passes away, and he realizes right until almost his last breath he had to invest his life in his, his life's accomplishment. And when his accomplishment is done, he dies soon afterwards. Mm -hmm. So so he always knew about time and its importance. And uh, it's so easy to waste, and then you don't accomplish anything. And I, I guess, going back to your question, uh, one of the reasons he accomplished a lot is he realized his time was valuable. And so he, yeah. didn't, he didn't want to waste it. And because he didn't waste it, he actually made a big difference in world history. Well, great. Let's take a quick break here, and then we'll wrap up. Although we don't offer transcripts of the podcast, Richard writes blog posts on many of the leadership topics discussed on the show. You can find these and other resources at richardblackaby.com. Richard, I really like what you said earlier about stewarding your relationships, and I think that's something that, uh, that I think we can all do better. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's worth noting again. But as as we move on, uh, a lot of people, a lot of our listeners may not even have heard of, of Wilberforce before. Of course, most people have heard of Churchill or of course. George Washington. Yeah. <laughs> if they listen to our podcast, <laughs> <laughs> they will have heard of Churchill. But uh, what makes him so successful as a leader, even though you know he doesn't have quite the fame of, of other great leaders yeah. In history. Well, I, you know, Metaxas makes a good point. He says uh, early on that, that Wilberforce was actually a victim of his own success. Because when he, when he is living, the entire view of society is that, that there's nothing necessarily evil about slavery, uh, that some people are just created inferior. And, uh, and, and in fact, it might be doing slaves a favor by bringing them into a civilized world and helping them enjoy the benefits of modern living, even if they're a slave. Uh, and, and not only that, but, but financially, people are making fortunes on the slave trade. Even the king of England has some of his portfolio invested in the slave trade. And so 
when the wealth, when all the members of parliament, the people who can actually end the slave trade, are making money from it, yeah, it's very, very difficult to change things. And when the church is not speaking against it, where it's it's just something you don't talk about, and no one has ever, none of the aristocracy has ever gone down to a slave ship and seen these slaves pulled out of the hold after months of having. Uh, you know, excrement and urine sloshing upon themselves out of the, the pans down below uh, and and people, all kinds of diseases spreading among all the slaves chained together. No one's seen ugly things like that. So they to them, it's all, they're all sheltered from that. And so for a guy like uh, Wilberforce to come along and say, uh, and, and expose the ugliness, the ugly side of human bondage and the exploitation of the weak and the oppressed. Uh, th- he's, it just seems as such so unpleasant, so ungentlemanly, so uncivilized to even discuss those topics. So yeah. when you realize all that he was up against, where he's got to actually convince people who are making a load of money from the, that, the oppression of people to actually walk away from their, their golden egg and uh, to give it up and to to face uh, the ugliness in society you real you realize that for him to do that he didn't just end slavery he ended the way people look at slavery and the oppression of other people and and it doesn't mean that there isn't uh human exploitation today but now people know it's wrong now even if it happens no one's going to say slavery is right it's good but in his day people thought that so he didn't just end an institution he he changed the way people thought and so mm-hmm. now when, when people say, oh, yeah, well, he ended slavery, everyone, now in our society, we think, oh, well, of course he, I mean, but that's just so obvious. I mean, everyone knows slavery is wrong. So, I mean, what he did is such an obvious thing. He made it obvious, which is what mm-hmm. makes his leadership so profound. It wasn't obvious in his day, but when he was done leading, it became, everyone changed the way they viewed something. And to do that, to change the way in an entire society uh, views uh, an issue is a whole other thing. And I think that's why it's important for uh, leaders today, because we look at modern society and some of the stuff that goes on there that exploits people, that degrades people, that uh, offends a holy God and his values and standards. And the church sometimes says, well, how can we change that? That's just the way people are. Society is just immoral. Pe- society just doesn't care about the values that God established. Well, they didn't in Wilberforce's day either. But when he was done, his society did value that and change. And that, that's what makes his leadership so phenomenal. And also, he, he had two goals in his life. One was the end of slavery. The other was what he called the, uh, the, the, the development of morals, uh, morals in society. And, by, and it, it, we don't understand it now, but, but, but in his day, there were public hangings. And you wouldn't just hang somebody. After you hung them, you might burn their corpse uh, in, uh, by fire in a public square, or you might dissect. They would actually bring surgeons in and dissect criminals who'd been hung so you could see the insides of a person's body. Wow. And, and, I mean, there was bullfighting, cockfighting, all, the exploitation of children in, in, uh, in the workforce, all kinds of... The, the, Metaxas estimates as many as 25% of women in in England were prostitutes. Uh, the, the moral society at that time was at, at incredible depths. And Wilberforce said, I want to change the morality of our society, the way we treat people, uh, and not just treat slaves. But I mean, that's part of it is if you can devalue people, then you, then you don't, aren't squeamish about making people slaves. And so he changed the, the moral fabric of an entire society, which in that day, was the superpower of the day. It's the most powerful nation in the world that he is changing. It's not just some tiny little nation that's not that difficult to change. It's the most powerful, wealthy nation in the world. And so that makes his leadership so much more significant. One or two other things just to say real quickly. One is that when he first had a, a, a profound encounter with God, he's a, he's a politician so his first thought is, I love God, now I'm going to get serious with God. So he, what he thought was, so I should quit my secular profession and be, join the ministry, become a minister. Yeah. And, uh, and he was seriously looking at doing that, and he actually was encouraged by John Newton, the, the author of Amazing Grace, who said, no, don't leave where you are. God has gifted you. He's given you those skills. Use those skills. God called you as a politician. 
So stay as a politician and see how, how God wants to use those political skills for good. And that was a profound moment in his life because uh, like so many people that get real serious with God, their first thought is, well, I'll be a minister or a missionary. And I see that all the time in the marketplace. I see business people that get to profound encounter with God and their first thought is, well, I should leave the business world and now work for the church somehow. And I would say, well, God called you to the business world. He, he's made you successful there. He's given you skills. Now, just don't leave that field. Now, just use all those skills God's given you for God's kingdom in the workplace. And that's essentially what Wilberforce ultimately did, is uh, he said, well, okay, God called me to be a politician. Now I'm going to use all those political skills for good instead of uh, for just my own personal gain. And so I think that's just a really powerful word for people today. Yeah. Uh, where has God put you now? And use that uh, for God's purposes, uh, and don't think that the only way to serve God is in the church. Yeah, and I think you and your dad uh, have said for a long time now that that uh, some of the the greatest works of God can are going to be done in the marketplace. Yeah, and uh, not necessarily uh, in in church work. So one last thing before we go, yeah. you've you've read several books, I believe, by Eric Metaxas. Yeah. What uh, what do you like about him as an author? Well, uh, what I say about Metaxas is I call I don't call him necessarily a serious historian. I mean, he does pretty good history. Uh, I don't, but but he's a popularizer of history, and I and I appreciate that because he uh, he anyone who likes history like I do had teachers earlier in his life who made history interesting, who yeah. showed you how exciting it was, and uh, and. And if you, if you don't like history, it means you didn't have someone like that. You had someone that just bored you with dates and details and droned on about stuff that didn't matter. And so what Metaxas does well is he, he makes history exciting. He brings out uh, the, the, the personalities and the issues and the struggles, and he makes you like the people and see the struggles they had. And so he does that really well. Uh, but what I would say sometimes... And, and I think that's a really important thing to do. And he shows you the importance of people in the past and why history matters and why we can be inspired by it today. Uh, he's written a couple other books. He wrote a great book on Bonhoeffer, which I think maybe is maybe even a little bit more of a serious historical study. He gets into some pretty deep theology, uh, but uh, it's certainly a, a well-done biography on, on Bonhoeffer. He's written a, a biography in the last year or so on, on Martin Luther, which I've got on my desk to read. I haven't read yeah. yet, but another looks like another very serious uh, work I've heard is, is quite good. He wrote a book earlier called uh, Seven Men and the Secrets of Their Greatness, and he looks at guys, just shorter chapters on people like George Washington uh, and uh, Eric Liddell and, and then also on, on Wilberforce and some of these as well, uh, and uh and, and I think, especially in that book, I think sometimes he takes a few liberties. I think because he's trying to make you like history so much, I think sometimes he glosses over a few things. Like, I think it's maybe in that book that he he talks about someone like Thomas Jefferson as if he probably was a Christian, which I just think is going a little too far. Sometimes we, we want to put such the, the very best light on people that we we give them more credit than is their due. I think with history, you should bring out all the best qualities in people but uh, and make you see how real they are, but that doesn't mean you overlook their shortcomings. I think you need to be equally yeah. honest about where they failed because they all have feet of clay as well. So I, I think as, as someone who's trained in history, there's a, f a few times he'll say something I think goes just a little too far in his enthusiasm for God and country and, and his Christian values. I think he maybe takes a little too much credit at times for some things in history that probably goes a little too far. Nonetheless, I like, he's got, he's, he's got lots of humor and he's a engaging storyteller. And really, I think that's the best way to tell history is just in, in stories and, and, and engage people with, with the story of history and then inspire them to try to change history in their day by the story that God's writing with their life today. All right. And you may want to pick up one of these books, certainly the one we talked about today. Yeah. And we will leave links for those in the show notes. And Great. we will talk to you next time. All right. Thanks for listening to the podcast. If this is something you enjoyed, review us on Apple Podcasts. And don't forget to subscribe and share with your friends. If you have questions or comments, please email us at podcast at blackbee.org.